Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Jeannie Graustein Lecture on Environmental Justice. Jeannie was a leader in the area in the Archdiocese of Hartford, especially through her work in the Office of Catholic Social Justice Ministries. Greetings to her friends and her family who are watching this from, from afar via live stream. Father Brian Pierce is a Dominican friar of the province of St. Martin de Porres in the southern part of the United States. He has served in Honduras, where he established a new community of preachers who worked with HIV and AIDS patients in the barrios and mountain villages. He has also served in Peru for a number of years. Recently, he served as associates to the Dominican nuns, where he was a liaison to the contemplative Dominican women throughout the world. He currently serves as an itinerant preacher, giving preaching workshops throughout the United States and Latin America. His books include We Walk the Path Together, Learning from Thich Nhat Hanh and Meister Eckhart, Praxis y Predicacion, and Jesus and the Prodigal Son. Please help me to welcome Father Brian Pierce as he addresses the topic, Clay, Breath, and Flowing River. Good evening. I hope y'all are okay with the text in here for a little bit of time. Uh, if, if, if I get into my real Texas accent and you can't understand me, just raise your hand and we'll try to. Um, genders, what is it? I, <laughs> I'm not good at electronic stuff, so. The down the bottom one? Okay, yep. great. Uh, <clears throat> I've had a, just a little in, in, intro here. Um, I've had a couple of wonderful periods of time spent in the, in the Amazon with our Dominican brothers and sisters who have been there for a couple hundred years, actually. Um, the present bishop of the vicariate of Puerto Maldonado is uh, a Spanish Dominican, a young, wonderful, just full of energy, young bishop, and has really um, kind of turned things around a lot. Uh, the two times that um, Bishop David invited me, uh, luckily I was able to, to respond. And as you uh, know, and I hope it'll come out a little bit in the, in the talk, and please feel free at the end, we can ask any questions or anything. Um, it's a really, rough situation in that part of the world these days. It's, uh, there's a lot of violence surging and growing um, in this area. So uh, uh, there's a couple, probably, probably will be a couple moments where it'll be a little bit hard for me to share some of this, but it's a really important place for us to be be with in prayer and solidarity and and it's a beautiful place too so I hope we can get some of that beauty as well. I'd like to begin with um, one of the what I think is one of the most beautiful scripture texts from our entire Judeo-Christian tradition. It's a text that we know well, one that grounds us in the beauty and bounty of God's goodness. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland and darkness covered the abyss, while a mighty wind swept over the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together were called seas. And
and God saw that it was good. God then separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness God called night. Thus evening came, and morning followed the first day. I suspect that that first day was probably something like we've just seen on the screen. This pristine beauty and innocence and welcome, this receptivity of God's grace filled with beauty. The words of these ancient scriptures are sacred, earthy, beautiful. In the beginning, God saw that it was good. It's so important for us from time to time to stop and remember that it's good, it's beautiful. And that's why we want to care for this earth. Our, en our ancestors had an innate sense that this gift called earth is our common home. It's where we live together. This is a metaphor that Pope Francis uses quite often, our common home, he calls this great earth that we live on. How is it possible then that some people learn to love and care for our mother, the earth, while others see it only as a business deal waiting to be executed? Another piece of private property to be bought and sold. A few years ago, I had the unbelievable joy of spending hours wandering through these falls, the Iguazu Falls that stretch from Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. Absolutely breathtaking. Just take a moment to breathe that in and feel it. The power of this water, gorgeous. How is it possible that some people learn to love and care for this earth, our common home, while others see it almost instantaneously as a business deal, something waited to be executed, another piece of private property to be bought and sold? and how important it is for us to cry out and say, basta, no more, enough, we've had it. These pictures of the Iguazu Falls stretch from Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. I took these pictures with a tiny little camera That was a few years ago, by the way. <laughs> I think I have a gray hair or two more since then. How could anyone look at that beauty and not almost want to fall on their knees? I don't understand. And how anyone would ever want to destroy and pollute these waters is beyond all imagine. But it's there, it happens. I remember standing in utter wonder and bliss as these waters cascaded in magnificent grandeur, like ballet dancers or ice skaters skating in tandem. I remember the feeling as if I were watching God create the universe for the very first time. It was clearly one of the most unforgettable natural wonders of the world that I have ever experienced. I remember the day I spent in these beautiful waters. I remember a couple of times of having this feeling like I should get on my knees. There was something so powerfully sacred about this place. I just leave you for a moment to just contemplate this 
beauty. Laudato si, mio Signore. Praised be to you, Lord. These are the opening words of St. Francis of Assisi's beautiful canticle of creation, as well as the title of Pope Francis's encyclical, Laudato Si. May you be pleased, is what the word means in, in Italian, I was going to say, in Latin. We're blessed that St. Francis of Assisi has returned to earth so that we can once again get busy to what we need to be busy about. Francis of Assisi has returned to bless his soulmate and namesake, Francisco, Francesco. Both of these saintly disciples, St. Francis and Papa Francisco, are saintly disciples. Men who open their eyes and see God. Their hearts are as beautiful and as green as the Amazon jungle, filled with forests and rushing rivers, jungles and bright colored birds. Both Pope Francis and Francis of Assisi remind us that creation is not private property, but God's gift, our common home, to use Pope Francis's phrase. It's a home that we share with the whole universe. It is here on this mountaintops and these beautiful waters that we come together as God's family and give thanks and give praise. On mountaintops and in these rivers, we come together and we give thanks to our mother, the earth, and we sing praise to the God whose hands we were molded from with wet clay from the ground. Praised be to you, my Lord, along with our sister mother earth. You sustain and govern us producing various fruits with colored flowers and herbs. As was true with ancient Israel, the early indigenous tribes of South America found ways to reach out to their neighboring tribes. They gave all they could to share their lives and their food, their thatched roof huts and lovely songs. Sometimes the encounter was peaceful and at other times it was not. They learned to wait for the other forest dwellers to show their faces. And they shared hymns and prayers to this great mother who gave birth to all that is. They gave thanks. Who were these early indigenous women and men living in these jungles of South America, their lives permeated with prayer and ritual to the God who has many names. I suspect, that, I suspect that most of us have seen the beautiful and powerful movie, The Mission, the story of the European Jesuit missionaries who journeyed into the jungles of Brazil. A little parenthesis uh, for a Dominican to speak favorably about Jesuits is a little <laughs> bit difficult. So I'm, I'm going to do my best tonight. But um, I have my little Dominican team over here to root me on. This story of Jesuit missionaries who journeyed into the jungles of Brazil in search of the rest of creation, the rest of God's gift that he wants to give to us. They set off with dreams and hopes, with a rugged readiness prepared to take great risks. They set off humbly, looking for beautiful colors, that would give them hope that there was life in these lands. They not only stumbled upon beautiful lands and rivers, they encountered other human beings as well, forest dwellers, children 
of a living God. When they did actually come face to face with the native communities, they did what human beings do naturally. They shared nuts and fresh fruits, greetings, songs, dances. Little by little, the gift of mutual trust began to blossom. In the movie, The Mission, some, something as simple as a Jesuit's violin suddenly became a sacrament of encounter, a sacrament of friendship, a bridge uniting people across boundaries. Do we still have that capacity today to build these bridges and bring our differences into a common dialogue? Human hearts open when we do this, and strangers experience a unique kind of holy communion. Music and the sharing of food gently bring down barriers as God smiles upon us. These next few uh, slides are from um, some of the places in the Amazon where I was. These, I took most of these pictures. These people are absolutely beautiful and innocent. They open their hearts to strangers and welcome one to come and cross the boundaries into their lands. Music and the sharing of food gently bring down the barriers as God smiles on those who gather on the banks of these massive and beautiful rivers. Simple gestures expended, extended to others have the capacity to open up human hearts. These are the pathways that have the capacity to bring healing to us in our world today. I played soccer with these little kids. <laughs> these are pathways to opening doors through which so that the other is welcomed as neighbor and friend. Maybe the dream of world peace is not so far off after all. We can only imagine what the first Spanish and Portuguese sailors experienced as they stepped onto solid ground for the first time after months and months of sailing through unknown waters. They suddenly found themselves standing face to face with indigenous men, women, and children. Their curious dark skin, their bodies painted with bright colors, extracted from native plants, and what about us today? Where, where are we in these pictures? The Church of the Americas has been pondering these questions in a focused way now for several years through a very impressive organization called RIPAM, the Pan American Amazonian Ecclesial Network, a very impressive organization that spreads throughout the Amazon region involving about 22,000 people directly involved in territorial assemblies. This is all throughout the Amazon region. Another arm of RIPAM helped to organize smaller dia dialogue groups to prepare for the Synod of the Amazon. Little by little, they prayed and organized and were ready to, to, when the Pope came, to tell them their stories in these recent me meetings that happened in the last few months. Peruvian Cardinal Pedro Barreto, who Pope Francis called upon to be kind of the organizer and the overseer of the recent synod, he was called to steer this great project this of dialogue and reflection and looking forward to the future. And he said this, he said, the Synod of the Amazon has deep waters. The encyclical Laudato Si calls us to take action because our mother, the earth, and the poor are crying as the earth is dying. 
Thanks to Cardinal Barreto and for his team of experts, 45 territorial assemblies, 45, were convened throughout the Amazon region. And this is not on highways, folks. 80,000 indigenous men, women, and children, 80,000 participated in the Synod of the Amazon. It was their way to reaffirm that, yes, God sees that it is good. Pope Francis, along with experts from across the region and around the world, are painfully aware that the mindless deforestation, this is Bishop David in the diocese where I was working with them, wonderful, young, full of life, Excuse me, I got lost here. Um, 80,000 people participated in these different small groups, small communities throughout the, the region. Pope Francis, along with experts from across the region and around the world, are watching as this mindless deforestation just strips the, the, the jungle. Throughout this region, I want to... All of these pictures are from uh, one of the big feast days in Puerto Maldonado, where Bishop David is the bishop and where I spent uh, two different periods with them for several months. The amount of illegal and unbridled exploration of petroleum and the constant use of toxic chemicals in the mining of gold and petroleum throughout the Amazon River Basin has already decimated 20% of the lung of our beloved Earth. In communion with the peoples of the Amazon region, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, and his team of collaborators are fighting with all the help that they can coalesce in an attempt to put on the brakes, of course, they are organizing with many, many other groups, to put on the brakes of this greedy and mindless runaway train that seeks to destroy our Mother Earth. This journey into the jungles of South America is about, as, is, is about much more than just saving trees from destruction, which is a very important thing, of course. It's about the life of our planet. It's about caring for this beautiful and immense universe that is a gift to us. Pope Francis constantly describes the encyclical Laudato Si as the deep waters of God and what God is asking of us for the evangelization of the Amazon region. There is one overriding goal behind this entire effort, to honor the gift of God's creation and to be a support for the inhabitants of these lands. Now, I, I don't know how um, much you'll be able to see. I can't see myself, the colors very much. But I want you to watch as I tried to make this so we could see the change of the color of waters as we move into the deeper parts of the Amazon. I'm going to go back. So look at this beautiful water here. This isn't one of the Amazon rivers. It's not the Amazon River, but it's one of them. It's, it's right in, goes through the town of Puerto Maldonado. Now, can you, can you begin to see the yellowish colors? I, I can't really see from here, but sort of uh, beige, yellow colors. I'll continue, and we'll point out this in a little bit. 
Pope Francis constantly is calling us back to this, to inviting us to go deep into these waters of God, asking the questions that need to be asked so that we can honor the gift of God's creation and to be a support for the inhabitants of these lands. For this effort to become a reality, we must be prepared to heed the words of the early, the early prophets, that it is time for us to beat our swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. One nation shall not raise the sword against another, nor shall they train for war again. In place of petroleum rigs and gold mines, that's what these are. So brothers and sisters, this area, and there's several slides now that are coming up. This was once a huge forest, what you're looking at right here, a huge Amazonian forest. And you already can see it. It gets a little worse here in a minute. But all of this is where they are either mining for petroleum, looking for petroleum, for gold, for silver, or whatever else. And so they, they dig it up. All of the, the, the gold mining is done through chemicals. And so all of these waters are now completely polluted with chemicals that they use to find the gold in the rivers. In place of petroleum rigs and gold mines, they've turned the Amazon sacred rivers into black and mustard-colored pools of death and destruction. It is time for our, us, sisters and brothers, people from all walks of life, to experience the healing of the wounds that these people are causing. We call ourselves Christians, and we need to join hands with non-Christians and non-believers Sisters and brothers who are passionate about caring for this earth, the synod is time to break bread together, to share our fish and our corn with one another. You can see the color here. It's poisoned water. We must be engaged in truthful and respectful dialogue. We must not forget the years of violence that have left deep wounds in the heart and soul of our indigenous and African brothers and sisters who inhabit these continents. This was a forest, a, a beautiful Amazon forest. It's time for us to stand up and to reach out and bring healing to these rivers, healing to our people and to our earth. It's helpful for us to remember that in the midst of the bloody Spanish and Portuguese invasions into the Americas, there were small contingents always of enlightened men and women who had the mindfulness to contemplate these beautiful lands and their inhabitants through the, inhabitants through the eyes of God. The Portuguese mariner Pedro Álvarez Cabral, who died in 1520, was an early explorer to what is today Brazil. And he's remembered as a man who went out of his way to treat the indigenous inhabitants that he encountered with great kindness, receiving them on, his, on board his caravel. Though greed and power were the engines that drove much of the interest in these lands on the other side of the world, we must remember those who came responding to a deep call from within the human heart. It was not greed for everyone that drove these early mariners and missionaries. For many of them, it was the love of humanity, burned, a, a love that burned in many a heart, mixed with the utter fascination with God's beauty and creativity. Yes, there was a lot of greed and a lot of lust for gold and money and riches. Another poison river. About the same time that the Jesuits were befriending the Guarani Indians in, the, in, in Brazil, my Dominican brothers and sisters, Bartolomé de las Casas, Antonio de Montesinos, Pedro de Córdoba, and Luis de Cáncer were reaching out to the indigenous peoples in the islands of the Caribbean, opening up a mission of hope and healing. As we ponder these stories, we must not forget that in God's heart, 
there's room for all of humanity. That's why it's important for us to remember these saintly, holy people that have fought for centuries to care for these lands and these peoples. Though we must never forget the brutal atrocities of years past, it's important for us to also remember those early saints who fought for Mother Earth. We have much to learn from their courage and their prophecy. Unfortunately, 500 years have gone by and these lands are still under attack by the gods of power and wealth. Greed still hides in the hearts of those who have sold their souls to the god of gold. This is the tragedy of our age. There's only one thing we know for sure, that the God of love and justice continues to journey with us on this path. In our times, we give thanks that the desperate cry of our earth is finally being heard. Pope Francis says, those who criticize our outreach to the poor are on the shore. They're not in the boat. The boat is the church headed for an ocean of love, justice, and peace, says Pope Francis. Those who stubbornly remain on the shore, he says, want a static church where nothing ever changes. In his closing address on October 27th of the Synod of the Amazon, Pope Francis noted that the Synod had offered a pastoral, spiritual, cultural, and ecological diagnosis of the region. This is what's left behind at when they've finished mining for gold. The future of the Amazon is linked to the future of our world. Canadian Cardinal Zerny went, up, went so far as to say, if we don't change, we won't make it. Pope Francis has urged the media to keep his eye, their eyes on the big picture, warning against elites in the church who obsess over some tiny little piece of the synod message. Pope Francis says, because they don't have the courage to be with the world, they think they are with God. I had the wonderful privilege a little over a year ago to be a volunteer friar in the diocese where Bishop David Martinez is the bishop. I had spent time in the Peruvian jungle with him some years before when I was living in Peru. And little by little, I've begun to understand a little bit more the larger picture. And that's what this uh, last six month visit was. I was able to see a little bit more of the larger picture of this Amazon region. It's a very complex reality as you might imagine but it is an important place for the church to stand up and speak its truth. I arrived last year to the Vicariate in Puerto Maldonado just as Pope Francis was heading home after his historical visit. There was a wonderful mission buzz and a tangible apostolic joy in every nook and cranny of that Vicariate. Uh, I wanted to pick, put this picture in here because this is Gustavo Gutierrez, the, the father of liberation theology, one of the greatest theologians of our time, and uh, a dear friend and a wonderful mentor. And that's his, uh, one of his scribes that helps him now put things together. Beautiful human being, Gustavo. He's, he's considered the, uh, they call him the father of liberation theology. So after the Pope left, uh, these, the, the, the streets were just full of, of people celebrating this gift that the Pope had come to see their land, to see their rivers, to see their poisoned rivers. Cardinal Barreto, the Archbishop of Huancayo, reminded the Synod participants to enter the Synod is to enter into the Amazon River, he says. He likens the 18th month preparation for the synod, that just finished, as you know, to the 1,100 tributaries that flow into the 4,000 mile long mighty Amazon River. 
That's a lot of water, folks. 4,000 mile long Amazon River. This is St. Martin de Porres, by the way, our beloved Dominican saint, Peruvian brother who was the son of a Spanish father and an African mother. Beautiful, holy man. Cardinal Barreto says, we're in a boat in the Amazon with a slow but good rhythm, aware that some are quite critical of this synod. One can hear criticisms from people that are on the river bank, but they never get in the boat. They can shout and they can insult with sophisticated microphones, he says, but they will not change our course. Cardinal Barreto recalls the pivotal role that Cardinal Bergoglio, now Pope Francis, played at the Aparecida gathering in 2007. This is a small indigenous community here. As we know, the spirit blows wherever it wants, and when the newly elected pope chose his name, Francis, as his spiritual namesake for the next part of his journey, the world and God's fragile creation danced with joy. In his homily at the mass of his inauguration on March 19th, 2013, Pope Francis made it very clear that the protection of God's creation would be a major priority of his pontificate. And it is clear that Francisco has kept his promise. Longing to learn more about the Amazon region and its multiple, re multiple realities, I was invited over, a little over a year ago to participate in several workshops organized by RIPAM in the town of Puerto Maldonado. I quickly began to understand the urgency of bringing the truth of the Amazon's precarious beauty and natural resources to the world's attention. It's important for us to point to this beauty that must be taken care of and cared for. The fragile situation of the indigenous peoples in the Amazon basin itself cannot be emphasized more forcefully. That's Bishop David with this wonderful indigenous man in one of the villages that we visited. And though some still choose to close their eyes and live in a world of plastic, the truth is the life of the Amazon is directly connected to the survival of our planet, our common home, to use Pope Francis's phrase. To protect the Amazon is to protect the Earth. The Amazon is magnificent and fragile at the same time. A few months ago, Jessica Patiachi Tayori, a teacher and member of one of the indigenous communities, the Harakbut indigenous community, they were forced into slave labor many years ago. And were this, this uh, tribe of indigenous people, the, the Harakbut, and over a, a number of years, uh, they, had, they, they were invaded uh, illegally to mine the rubber trees that were in that part of the jungle. Uh, let me just, forced into slave labor and murdered by the thousands after the illegal invasion of their lands by rubber companies decades ago, the Harakbut once numbered as 50,000 members, inhabitants of that particular tribe, have now been reduced today to less than 1,000. From 50,000 inhabitants of this tribe, today they have only 1,000. Mrs. Tayori made a direct appeal to Pope Francis when he was in Peru recently to please bring their story to the international courts so that her people could bring their story and tell it to others. They're faced daily with threats and violence and might not be able to even live on the land that, the little bit of land that they have. 
we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing? Are we not all God's people formed by the clay of the earth? Do we see the face of God's people? Do we hear their songs? Do we see the divine face when we see them? Each time we enter into our neighbor's world, we're entering into the heart of God. Patriarch, Bar Patriarch Bartholomew, a highly respected synod father from the Eastern Church, he was uh, present at the synod, Patriarch Bartholomew, said the following. He says he has spoken in particular of the need for each of us to repent of the ways that we, each of us, have caused the planet's disfigurement and destruction. Pope Francis has repeatedly stated this firmly and persuasively, challenging us to acknowledge our sins against creation. For human beings to destroy, for human beings to destroy the biological diversity of God's creation, for human beings to degrade the integrity of the earth by causing changes in its climate, by stripping the birth of its natural forests or destroying its wetlands, for human beings to, come, to contaminate the earth's waters, its land, its air, and its life, says Pat Patriarch Barth Bartholomew, those are sins. For to commit a crime, he says, against the natural world is a sin against ourselves and a sin against God. This is a little uh, rural school that we just happened upon one day and they were practicing their little preparation for the Independence Day of their, so they were all dressed up. The Amazon jungle home is home to nearly half a million indigenous people from 20 different nationalities. It's one of the most biodiverse places on the face of the earth, and yet it is vulnerable to brutal industrial explo exploitation with irreversible global implications. When Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro took office in January 2019, I'm sure you're familiar with that name and probably saw some of the pictures of those, those uh, Brazilian forests burning like crazy. He plunged, the Brazil, the, the, he plunged Brazil and the Amazon and its indigenous peoples into the worst environmental crisis in a generation. We've seen the horrific results. Millions of hectares, hectares of Amazon deforest and burned. Indigenous forest guardians murdered in an onslaught attack on indigenous rights. In the small city of Puerto Maldonado, where I lived for a while, four blocks from our small Dominican community on the edge of the Amazon jungle, I have often counted 10 to 20 huge lumber trucks, 10 to 20 a day, each of them carrying several tons of trees right through the middle of this tiny little town, truck after truck after truck after truck, each of them carrying tons of huge trees cut down. They pass by police officers. It's all illegal. And they just ride right down the middle of the town, taking these to the, to the ocean where they're going to then put them on boats. I would see these trucks going through town every day. And so one day I asked somebody, I, I, as, as one of these trucks was rolling down these tiny little streets, they're, they're huge. They, they, they carry tons of trees in one of these trucks. And I said, where do they do with all this stuff? Where are they taking it? And this per person looked at me and he said, todo va para la China. It's all going to China. Peru, as m many of you may know, is home of the fourth largest rainforest in the world. 
In fact, half of Peru's land is classified as forest, the vast majority of which is in the Amazon basin. Though, forestation, def, though deforestation in Peru has trad traditionally been fairly low, today it's now one of Peru's largest businesses. By the year 2011, it was estimated that approximately 7 million hectares, which is 27 million square miles of lumber, had already been cut down. 27 million square miles of forest gone. In 2012, the nonprofit Environmental Intelligence, Intellig Intelligence Agency calculated that as much as 80% of the timber leaving the country is all leaving illegally, which means that at all of the stops, they're paid off to keep moving. Deforestation is advancing at an unbelievably accelerated rate. Thanks to the recently completed interoceanic highway connecting Peru with Brazil, the, the, the jungle of Peru with Brazil. Uh, it's now, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a highway now that goes all the way from the, the Peruvian Amazon into Brazil and from Brazil to ships heading east. Deforestation is advancing at, at, at an unbelievably accelerated pace. The Amazon, Amazonian tribes are, are almost indefensive in, with these, this, this great amount of power and with the cooperation of, of local police officers who are paid off, soldiers that are paid off at the, at the border crossings. It's, it's almost impossible for them to stop this. Christians have been plunged into rivers and baptismal fonts for over 2,000 years, awakening us to our call as followers of Jesus to speak the truth, to stand up. The Amazon is all about water and the harmonious movement of the rivers and of life itself in a relationship of respect that grows out of knowing that life steers the water and the water steers life. Who knows how long that will last. These are words that flow from the very heart of God, my sisters and brothers, simple words that are calling us to conversion. Only by opening our eyes and our ears and our hearts will we, will we be able to contemplate and protect this magnificent universe that God has generously shared with us. Of course, this topic of synodality is much more complex than it might seem, and I certainly will not attempt to dive into the topic in a few minutes. I have no doubt, though, that Pope Francis has a few unfinished tasks on his desk when he gets back to Rome. And my guess is, and it's just a guess, that we have not yet seen the last of the rather tense synod topics such as women deacons and married priests who possibly could be empowered to serve in certain limited ministries in remote jungle areas where indig indigenous communities have very little access to sacraments and other pastoral needs. I'm just going to say something that I've been thinking ever since all of this stuff has been coming out. You know, at the very end of the synod, Pope Francis made this decision to not go forward with those two very kind of risky things, which were the, the ordination of married men who could help with masses throughout the, and ordaining women deacons. Uh, I, and I think hundreds of thousands of people were kind of let down when that news came out. But as I was watching and hearing and reading during those last days of the Synod and when those decisions were made, something tells me that Pope Francis has a plan. And this is just my intuition. I think he, I think he pushed it as far as he could push it this time. And I think his idea is just let the water 
calm down a little bit. And my sus suspicion is that in a couple of years, then he's going to be able to go through with it. It's uh, just my it's my sense, but I think he's so uh, is so passionate about reaching the poor in this huge area of land with the sacraments. I think Pope Francis has got a plan, and I'm not sure what it is. He hasn't asked me to give my ideas, but um, but anyway, I say that to. I, I was I, I was depressed for two days after the, the, that decision was made that he wasn't going to do that. But then I watched a few of the things that happened in those the next couple of days after that, and some of the things that were were being written and they were saying. And I just had this sense that Francis has his plan. And this Cardinal Barreto, who is just fire, um, is right next to Francis, pushing him. So I think. I have hope. Those who live in the margins of these poor, broken parts of our southern brothers and sisters have a lot to teach us. They are telling us something about what it means to be amazed by this ever-renewing voice of the Spirit and how important it is for us to trust to follow, to be with, in solidarity with. We are being reminded that it's from the periphery, the margins, that Christ makes his way into the world today in the midst of all these tensions and contrasts. Pope Francis speaks of a process in which the periphery illuminates the center. That is a powerful image we need to hold on to. It's the periphery that it's the, the, the periphery illuminates the center without pretending to take its place, says Francis, but contributing to transforming, purifying, and renewing it. In the end, says Francis, it's the poor of spirit who will teach us the way to God, reminding us how to see and how to listen, to be amazed at the ever new voice of the Spirit. It is from that marginal existence that Christ, this is Francis's closing words, it is from that marginal existence that Chris, Christ made his way and continues to do so today in our world with all its tensions and contrasts in order to redeem it. So when Pope Francis speaks of this process in which the periphery will illuminate the center, I think he is, that's, I think that's his new um, insight. And that's why I think he held back on these, these tricky things that didn't get passed that most of us would, hope, would have hoped would have been passed. I think he realized that he needed to go deeper into the center and let the center then change those on the outside. So um, let's keep our hopes up and uh, let's keep struggling for this beautiful earth of ours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Brian. We have time for a few questions. Um, to begin with, how do you keep paying attention to the periphery? Because I know you've been in several different places, and especially now that you're back in Texas and not in the Amazon or Peru or Central America, how do you keep paying attention to that periphery? Well, I, I suspect that you all have know the answer to that. Um, the periphery is everywhere, and the center is everywhere. Um, I think it's about living with our eyes open and our ears attentive. And, you know, I mean, just in these couple of days I've been here, I, what, what, what this university is doing and sending people out into these places and... 
touching the poor and being with the poor. So I think uh, we have to just get out of the center and get out to the peripheries. And I mean, I, I think I'm speaking to the choir here, so um, singing to the choir, or whatever. But we, I, I, I would say in a in in a in an environment that you're most of you are working with young people. Um, I think that's the great challenge. Let's let's get these young people out to the peripheries. And again, I know I think this is a school that that's a pretty common theme, but our churches need to do that. And and you know, places like. Irving, Texas, where I live, need to get into the center a little bit more um, and listen to the, the voice and listen to the cry and looking at the faces. And that's how it happened to me. I, I, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I was a foreign exchange student at age 17 in Peru. Um, I didn't have any choice of, of what country I was going to go to. I was sent to Peru through the AFS program. And I, and I lived in Cusco, the most beautiful city in the world, if you ask me. And it was the face of indigenous people carrying huge amounts of weight on their shoulders and walking through the streets with these big, bulky, massive amounts of, of firewood or stones or whatever they were carrying. And I, 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 was, I was 17 years old. A war was going on. Uh, the day we arrived in Cusco to begin our, our months as foreign exchange students, we were told that there was a, um, what do you call it, where you, Like students can't go out. Uh, what's the word? Um, a curfew. The whole, the whole. So here I am. Here, not me. It was a group of us. We're all 16, 17 year olds, and we show up to Cusco. We're going to be a foreign exchange student in this most gorgeous place. And the first thing they say to us is, "There's a curfew from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. every day." <laughs> 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds with a curfew at, at 6 p.m.? you got to be crazy. And so what did, what, did, what did all the high school kids do in, in Peru during those months? It was because of the, there was, the war was breaking out again. Uh, no. no. <laughs> they, tur they decided they would, they would meet in houses every night and have parties all night long. And the parents couldn't do anything because they couldn't go home at midnight, so... So they, 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 and actually a, a, a record was, was done called toque, De Toque a Toque. Toque is, is like the, the, the moment. So from, it means from the beginning of the, of the evening to the end of the evening, for De Toque a Toque. So they found their way to, the, the youth found a way to dance all night in the time of, of curfew. That's not the most important information to them, though. <laughs> Exactly. Or what the solutions need to be. So, here, what do we do here? You talk about the institution, Yale University, massive endowment, much of it is fossil fuels, and students have been engaged in rather dramatic protests, even at a famous football game recently. Um, but there's money involved, and how do we address that, especially since our own community has its own endowment, overseen by the managers at Yale. What do we know about where that money is and what it's doing and what should we be saying to, as a community, to our board of directors about what they should be saying in that regard? Well, I think, I mean, uh, for several years now, I, I know a lot of Groups I know, for example, a lot of Dominican sisters and brothers groups are, you know, questioning who are who, where are you know the banks where we're taking our money, the et cetera, et cetera. I think we have to keep doing that work. 
of getting into onto these boards and getting into these uh, situations where we can speak to the people who are making the decisions. Uh, you know, why are we going this direction when we could be going this direction that has a, an environmentally positive path? And so I think we just have to keep asking these questions to big companies. Uh, you know, get out, get on these somebody on the board of directors somehow and start from the bottom speaking the truth. And uh, I think it, you know, I, it be, for me it began as a, as a 17 year old foreign exchange student. So don't, don't, don't think that those simple little things like that, like taking a group of young people to a, you know, a, a poor area, to me, it was the seed that changed my life. So if it happened to me, it could happen to many others. And I think we have to just keep taking people. And I would say those would be the kind of the two things. We need to keep doing these trips, you know, college students making trips to poor areas, rural areas of our own country, going to Latin America, going to wherever. And, and then we have to do this work with the big boards of big companies, big industries in this, and try to get some leverage to change some of these commercial policies and things. So I think, and we just gotta, it's, it's ant work of ants, as you know, some of you who've done that kind of slow work of getting into a, getting a little bit of a voice in one of these boards, boardrooms, you know, so um, we just gotta, and I want to say something about, I'm, I'm a Dominican friar, and I have some of my Dominican sisters over here. In our order, it's the Dominican sisters who have done all of that work. We're the ones, we're the ones that are behind. And, it, and I've, I've seen it all over the world. Women, religious, organizing and getting onto these boards and speaking the truth, and so I'm, um, I'm very grateful for being a brother of my sisters who have taught me a lot about speaking the truth. Oh. That was the, the indigenous kids playing marbles. <laughs> we could go back and look for that if you wanted to, but. Do they have a particular spirituality to people that you encounter? Oh, this is kids at, at one of their schools here, by the way. They, when, they, when they arrive, this is an indigenous community, and when they arrive to school, they have a little snack to, most of them have, shown up at school without having had anything to eat. So the school provides this little breakfast for them. Oh, I think I did the wrong thing here. Well, anyways. Uh, and you're Dominican sisters again. <laughs> We'd be lost without them, so. You know, the Dutch, the, the, oh, excuse me. Uh, you know, the, you had the, the Dutch, the, the Spaniards, the Italians, um, all coming to look for their pieces of property around the world. And um, 
what was the rest of the question? I'm s oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, okay, Dominic was a Spaniard, and that's where the order was born. Uh, the Spaniards, as you know, were some of the first ones to come to these lands, and so very early, the Spaniards and the Portuguese were the, the first um, countries to take, to, to take these big trips in, to, the, to the Americas. Uh, for, for the Dominicans, it began with Span the Spanish Dominicans went and they, uh, the place that they landed, you know, most of these, these virgin voyages, they just went until they hit land somewhere. So, uh, for example, if you've seen the mission, the, mov the, the movie, the mission, of the, uh, which is about the Jesuits in Brazil, you know, they, they, they stumbled upon that land. And for the Dominicans, our first stumbling onto land was in the early 1500s in the islands of the Caribbean. Um, and that's where there's a, a couple of very well-known names. Bartolomé de las Casas was in that, was part of that group. Um, Pedro de Córdoba and, and Luis de Cáncer were three of the, of the early Dominican uh, voyagers that were, and so they, uh, on, the, on the islands of Cuba and Dominican Republic, that's where Dominican Republic comes from, those Dominicans that went there. Um, that was kind of the first new world place that, that the Spanish Dominicans came to. And then, it, you know, they went to other places, but Latin America, it was, was, how would I say it, was brought into this world through Span Spaniards, and, and, and they, that's why Latin America is Latin America, and the piece of it that isn't Spanish-speaking is uh, Portuguese-speaking, so the, it, it, it was all about which country landed at which place, you know, so. Um, and the Dominicans were, I, I know more about the American piece of it, but they also went east to the Philippines and some of those places, so um, I don't know if that's any. Well, thank you all for Yeah, I don't really know much about that part of the world. I've my most of my life has been spent in Latin America. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything to say about that. I don't know. Yes, thank you. I think that in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in particular, the Dominicans are more concerned with trafficking and getting children off the streets and helping women. Um, I haven't heard as much about environmental kinds of things. That was my impression. They pose issues of just human safety and environmental safety as well. Well, thank you so much, Father Brian, and thank you for all of you for being here tonight. Thanks for an enlightening lecture and beautiful pictures of the Amazon.